So now let's really analyze that formula that we saw on the previous video just briefly, which is the formula for the confidence interval for population mean, mu. So we don't know what the population mean is, which is pretty common. You know, me, to know mu, we'd have to poll everybody or, or sample everyone in the whole population. And then it's no longer a sample, and it's really hard to do. So we create an interval for mu where the population mean we think will fall. And that's the x bar, which is your sample mean, plus or minus your critical value times your standard error. So that back end of that formula, that's the margin of error right there. Your, your critical value, which is how many standard errors you want to be away from the mean, right here. So you take your mean, and you add and subtract away critical value times standard error. And that creates margin of error that you're adding on and subtracting away from your point estimate. So it works the same way as it did in 9.1. The critical of t value is t alpha over 2. Your degrees of freedom is n minus 1, just like it was before in previous videos. And the point estimate is x bar. That's the center of your interval. Now, if you're going to do this, there's some requirements that you have to meet. So you have to have a random sample, of course, because if we don't have a random sample, we have sampling bias, and that's a big no-no, as we learned about in section 1.5. Then we need an independent sample. So it's a little counterintuitive, but you actually need to take a small enough amount that you're less than 5% of your population. Otherwise, you're losing independence. That's only really a problem if you're sampling without replacements. Right? If you're doing it with replacement, like uh, dice or coins or roulette wheels, then that's no big deal. Right? You automatically have independence. But if you're sampling without replacement, then you need your sample size to be small enough that it's negligible, right? less than 5% of your population size. In theory, it's the same reason you know, little kids can steal candy from the um, bulk candy bins and no one will ever notice, right? or at least they think no one will ever notice, because they're taking such a small amount in relation to the larger group. And then we need the distribution to be normal. So that either is given to us or in a normal probability plot or it's written in the instructions somewhere, or we need the sample size to be greater than 30. Now these things should all be looking extremely familiar because they're based off the central limit theorem from section 8.1. Also in section 8.1, we learned that that s over the square root of n is called the standard error of x bar. Well, it's an approximation of it, which is fine. And we also learned about using t alpha over 2 in um, section, well, earlier on in this section. Now, the thing is that I didn't want to write all of that when I wrote, oops, wrong way, sorry, going the other way, um, when I wrote this. So I kind of wrote a stripped down version here. Oh, it's pretty much everything, actually. I take it back. So you got your point estimate, which is x bar, your degrees of freedom, which is n minus 1. There's your formula in the middle right there. And then there's the calculator steps right there, t interval. And then those same three conditions, these are the conditions from 8.1. So to do a confidence interval for the mean, you need 8.1, the central limit theorem for the mean. To do a confidence interval for proportions, you need the central limit for, theorem for proportions, which was 8.2. So these requirement sections are coming from 8.2 up here and 8.1 down here. So they should look very, very familiar. Okay, so let's go construct a confidence interval. Why not? I mean, we have the formula for it, so we should be able to do this. And there's the calculator steps, but we'll see how to do it as we do this problem. So the FBI compiles data on robbery and property crimes and publishes the information. A simple random sample of reported pickpocket offenses yields the losses in dollars shown below. So these are all the pickpocketing reported, um, yeah, report, reported crimes that we have for pickpocket offenses to the FBI. And this is just a sample of them. Okay, so now we're going to find the following. We want to find the mean the standard deviation and n. I blocked them off because I've already found them. Now, this has been a while, but it was the first weeks of the class. You learned to go to stat, edit, and enter a huge list of data. So I have all the pickpocketing offenses already typed in here. Um, if you don't have them typed, which of course you wouldn't, you clear out your old data with clear, enter. So you go up, press clear, enter. I'm not going to do it because I don't want to make it go away and then you type in all your data points. All right, so I have that done. Then I go to Stat, Calculate, 
one variable statistics. It's been a while. My list is in L1, so I'll leave it L1. Frequency list we always leave blank except for two sections, 3-3 three, three and 6-1 which is the weighted mean stuff and the mean for a grouped data set and expected value, which is the mean for a probability distribution. All right, so then calculate and press enter and there it is. So I get that X bar is 513.32. I can see S is 262.23 and of course N is 25, but I knew that already because I can see the table is 5 by 5. All right, so there are my values. All right, so what's the point estimate? Well, the point estimate's the center of my interval. It's the thing I'm going to build this on. And if you look at your formula, it tells you that the point estimate is x bar. Right there. Oh, sorry, wrong sheet. I'm looking for this one. There it is. So it says point estimate is x bar. It's right there on your formula sheet for your appendix, which you should have on you at all times from now on. All right, so x bar is my average. Um, it's what I expect to be. It's my single best guess for what the average is for all pickpocketing offenses. And that's what I wrote, right? So it's my guess from you. It's my single best guess. Single is why they use the word point. It's one value. And guess, because it's a guess, it's an estimate, right, for what I think mu is. I don't actually think it is, by the way, that value. I think it's close to that value, right? I think um, it should be somewhere near that value. Okay, now I need to verify all the requirements to conduct a test, or to, to make a confidence interval, sorry. So that's the whole random, independent, normal business. So I need these three things to be true. Okay, so let me type those up one second. Okay, so for part one, was it random? And the answer is yes, it was. It was given in the setup. They wrote right here, it's a random sample of pickpocketing offenses. So right there, they're telling us that it's random. And honestly, if it's not random, we have huge problems because that would mean it's biased and we have no way of dealing with that. So we're basically always going to assume random, even if it's not given to us somewhere, it, it's kind of assumed everywhere because we can't really work with it otherwise. All right, so we have random. What about independent? Well, yes, and that's because n equals 25 is far less than 5% of all the pickpocketing offenses. So right there, I'm actually telling you what I think n is in words, and that's what you have to do as well, capital N, that is. So if you look at the formula, it says that little n, which is your sample size, which for us was 25, is less than or equal to 0.05 capital N as long as we're sampling without replacement, which we assume we are. So we assume, we assume without replacement, right, it's not dice or roulette wheels or something, right, and therefore we need n, little n, to be less than 0.05 capital N. So little n is less than or equal to 0 0.05 times all pickpocket offenses. And it's a little bit, well of, well, of course it is, right? So let me just write it that way. So, of course, right? Just logically speaking, you know that 25 has to be way less than all the, heck, it's, it's less than 5% of all the ones that are probably reported in a single day, let alone through the whole year. So um, we're using logic. So, and of course, we're waving our hands at it a little bit like a magician, like, ta-da, of course it must be. But it must be, so we're not going to belabor the point. But you do want to put in this formula, say what your little n was, put in a less than or equal to sign, put in 0 0.05, but then don't write capital N, say what capital N was, which is the number of all pickpocketing offenses, right? And we're way less than that. All right, last but not least, was your distribution normal? Well, yes, that's what the graph is drawn for. So the graph is a normal probability plot that we learned about in chapter 8.3. Right? Since the points are linear, then that shows us 
that the distribution is normal, even though n was less than 30. Right? So normally we worry about it being less than 30. But since the, the graph over here shows us that these dots mostly are staying close to the line, then we're OK, and the distribution is, in fact, normal. All right, now that we know that it's OK to make a confidence interval, let's go ahead and do it. So we're going to construct a 95% confidence interval for the average of all reported pickpocket losses in dollars. And we're going to show the formula, the substitution, and the final result in order to earn full credit. Well, the formula part's easy. Right, the formula part is the part that comes right out of your appendix. What's interesting about it is when you take your exam, you have five formulas on this page, the three down here and the two up here. So by writing the formula down correctly as the one for a single value mean, for a confidence interval for a mean, I should say, you're proving to me you know which formula to use when. And there's going to be more formulas, by the way, in Chapter 11 coming as well. So then I have to substitute. But I know that x bar is 513.32. I found it up above. And I know that s is 262.23 and n is 25. So that part's all easy. The hard part is this 2.064, right? So x bar, s, and n were part a of this problem. We already found them. How do I find that 2.064? Well, I think about the fact that I know my confidence level. I know my confidence level is 0.95. That means that alpha is its complement, which is 0.05. And then I think about this formula, and I think, hmm, there's alpha over 2 in there. I bet you that's important. I bet you I have to take alpha and cut it in half to get 0.025. And then I think about my sample size, which was 25, which means my degrees of freedom is 24. And these two things together combine to get me my inverse t function right here. So we do inverse t 0 0.025, so let me go distribution, inverse t, oop, I hit the wrong thing, sorry, inverse t, there we go, 0 0.025, 24 for my degrees of freedom, not 25, 25 was my sample size, so 24 is my degrees of freedom, and that gets me 2.064 which is right there. So that's where the 2.064 in here in the table comes from. Excuse me, in the formula comes from. And I was thinking in my head about the table, because that's another way you could find this. Row 24.025, it's right here, 2.064, right there. So that's another way you can get this. Now to come up with the final result, I could type all that into a calculator, of course, but I could also be wise and realize, hey, if I made any mistakes along the way, I bet you the calculator will not know that and give me the correct answer if I run the appropriate interval on it. So how will I know what the appropriate interval is? Well, luckily for you, I wrote it right here. It's a t interval, right? That's a one sample mean interval. So when I go to the stat, and I go to tests, I'm going to pick the t interval, which is number 8. So I'm going to go down there with my arrow, or you can actually just press the number 8, and it will automatically happen. And here you have to make a choice. Data, if you have a whole column of data in there, which we do in list 1, my confidence level is 0.95, and I go to calculate and press enter. and it runs the whole thing. 405.08, 621.56. And interestingly, it would have given me x bar and s and n if I had asked it to. So that's my confidence interval. Oop, right here. Now for the record, we could have found that with stat tests, and I could have run at number 8, t interval, but picked stats instead. Stats is the one you use if you don't have a column of data. If you just knew this was 513.32 and 262.23 and n was 25, you could type all that in. So sometimes it'll just be given to you in this big old paragraph and you've got to read through the paragraph and find your x bar and find your s and find your n and then you put them all in and see it gives you the same answers 405.08 and 621.56.
Okay, so now how do we interpret that? Well, we are 95% confident that the true average amount of all reported pickpocket offenses, notice it's reported because, of course, most people don't report when they've lost 20 bucks, except for that one guy in the data set, or girl. Um, so, But it's the true average amount of all reported pickpocket offenses. So you have to put in what your popular, what you're trying to estimate, right, which is your parameter, mu. So you're writing it out in words. Don't just say the mean. What's the mean? The true mean average amount taken from all reported pickpocket offenses is between 405.08 and 621.56. And make sure you use units if appropriate, which in this case it totally is, because this is talking about dollars. All right, last but not least, a local law enforcement agency states that the amount of money for pickpocket offenses locally is lower, uh, that's key, than the national average with an average of $420. $420. So if this amount is correct, so just assuming that everything this person's doing is fine, does the local appear to be lower from the nation? And explain. And the answer is no, because 420 is not lower than your entire interval. Then you can't prove that this 420 is lower. If it had been 400, then you would have supported. But it's 420, which is in the middle of our interval, so that doesn't support that it's lower. So that's what I wrote up. So the local average was 420, and the claim right here is that that, that 420 is lower than the na national average, the national average being represented by our interval, right? And since 420 is not below our entire interval, our interval does not support this claim, right? 420 is within our interval limits. If they want to say that it's lower, then you have to have a value that's lower than the entire interval, like 400, say.